to Howard Fishman and Sarah Larson. Hi, everybody. Hi, Howard. Hi, Sarah. <laughs> Thanks for being here. This is such a great group. Um, just before we start, I'm curious, is there anyone who's totally unfamiliar with Connie Converse's music and life story? Okay. But most people know something. And I assume love her, so great. <laughs> well, dig in. Um, so this book is so beautiful, and you've been working on it for a very long time. And I love, I feel like anyone who knows Connie's work at all gets drawn in through the power and the slight eeriness and beauty of her songs. And that's how you start the book, too. Can you just tell us a little bit about that that moment and also starting the book with it? And yes. Uh, I started the book by talking about the first time I heard. OK, so I should say two people who are here tonight told me about a figure into this story. Um, Russell Farhang, who's sitting right here, was the first person to tell me about Connie Converse. And he said, there's this woman, I heard her on NPR, on uh, WNYC, on David Garland's show. And you're gonna freak out when you hear her. Run out and buy her album right now. And I didn't do that. Uh, <laughs> and then sometime shortly thereafter, I was at my friend Christopher Moore's house at, for a holiday party. and. Uh, a song came on called, uh, well, I didn't know what it was called. A song came on that froze me in my tracks. And I was, I don't know, in a corner of the room, minding my own business. The song came on. It stopped me. And I found Christopher and I said, what in the world is that? And he said, oh, that's Connie Converse. And I thought, oh, that's the person Russell told me about. And I went home that night, and on my way home, I stopped and bought the album, How Sad, How Lovely, which is a compilation of Connie Converse's recordings from the 1950s. And I, I started listening to it, and I became convinced that Connie Converse was not real, because um, it seemed impossible to me that these songs could exist in total obscurity, because they were so good. It seemed impossible that, to think that we would not all know about her. And so I thought it was a hoax. I thought it was somebody from today who had created a character named Connie Converse and put out an album of contemporary music and fashioned this backstory about a disappearance and the starving artist in Greenwich Village and recording in her apartment, et cetera. And it, it all sounded like a very clever marketing campaign to me. But the music to me sounded like it could be made today or in 2010, that's certainly what I thought. I think it could still be made today. Um, so that is how that was my introduction to the world of Connie Converse, and as I always say, uh, she got under my skin and I couldn't get her out. And 13 years later, here's the book. <laughs> I love the way you describe that scene because you're at a party, you're feeling a little awkward, you don't necessarily know that many people, and you're looking at. I feel like so many people, sensitive people especially can relate to being at a party and like looking at people's books and music. <laughs> That's what I was doing. <laughs> right. <laughs> and then you hear this voice and it's sort of like, and, and I think the reason she's so exciting, besides, you know, she's a genius, is that I feel like she speaks to those kinds of sensitive people and she herself is that sort of person. And also you feel, and you talk about this in the book, kind of complicit with her. For some reason, I always think about Flannery O'Connor when I think of her, who you mentioned a couple times in the book too. But that feeling of like, you're in on the same joke and you have a similar sense of humor and she respects you enough to sort of be a little playful. And that song, let's talk about that song a little bit because that I think is a lot of people's entry point. And, uh, and it's funny. Yeah, uh, you're talking about talking like you. Yeah. Yeah, uh, talking like you. Um, to me, that was this, uh, um, the, the giveaway to me that she wasn't real was in the song she says, up that tree there's sort of a squirrel thing. And I thought, that does not sound like anybody from 1950 talking. That sounds like somebody today is a squirrel thing. Yeah. Uh, and yes, um, the song is about uh, being alone and being okay being alone because um, 
the absent lover uh, who is addressed in the story is not there and she would rather not be with that person anyway because she has uh, a babbling brook and a squirrel and a bird and pigs to keep her company instead. <laughs> <laughs> Which is so good and so amazing. And I have a couple things to say about this. One, I think she says sort of a squirrel thing because it rhymes with quarreling and because it's funny and she knows that it'll be like a fun thing to do in the song. What is like a squirrel, a chipmunk? A chipmunk isn't gonna be an you know. Right. She's just kind of being fun in a way we like. Yes. But then, and it's it's like it's a it's a beautiful song. It's a funny song. It's a strange song. And then I'm gonna just read a teeny bit of the book because okay, it is a bravura bit of songwriting, a lyric both empowering and entrancing. She doesn't need anyone, neither their sympathy nor their pity. We all want to be like this all the time, self-assured, witty, happy, reliant on nobody and no one, free. Listening to this song, I found it hard not to be captivated by this person, to want her as a friend, to know her. And I, I love that, and it's so beautiful, but also, I hear you know, some loneliness and melancholy in that song. She's, she's being funny and defiant and saying that, you know, it's just as nice to have this pig and this, this bro. But the song's all about you, kind of, and you not being there, so there's a little, you do feel a little lonely. Yes, uh, I, I, my feeling is, and I talk about this in the book, uh, that she is saying in the song, she says, I don't stand in the need of company. But what I think, what I hear when I hear that is, I, I do stand in the need of company, just not the company I have found so far. Um, she doesn't suffer fools, and she doesn't want to be with the wrong people. So she'd rather be alone than be with dummies. <laughs> but also, she'd rather not be alone. So she's reaching out in these songs for somebody who understands her. And so we, as I say in the book, we flatter ourselves that maybe it could be us. And you talk at some point, I'm not sure if it's about that song or a different song, but the feeling of her writing to someone she doesn't know yet. Um, possibly a love. And I remember being a little kid and listening to the Beatles and listening to I Will and thinking, like, what a cool idea to write this love song to this person that he hasn't met yet, you know? And then it's like she was reaching out to you in a strange way. I mean, to all of us, I guess. To all of us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. To the people who would understand her, which is today. Yeah. Now, now we can hear her and there's no obstacle between us and her music. But back then, there were too many obstacles that she couldn't get through. Yeah. So I thought we'd talk maybe a little about a couple songs and then about her life story. Um, there's also Roving Woman, which I love. Does anybody, anybody know that song? <laughs> so it's just sort of, um, she has a funny way of writing these lyrics that imply a lot and also leave a lot between the lines. Right. So Roving Woman, can you talk about that a little? Yeah, uh, Roving Woman is about the pleasures of uh, day drinking, gambling, and sleeping around. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, for uh, a woman writing in 1952, I think she wrote that song, um, it's pretty shocking. It's also pretty shocking for this to come from the pen or the typewriter of the daughter of very strict New England puritanical parents. Um, her father was the head of the local temperance society, uh, the Anti-Saloon League. <laughs> and in the song, she talks about going to saloons. She actually uses that word. So it was kind of a real thumbing her nose at, at the culture that she came from and her parents. And it's delightful and uh, she uh, uses the I don't want to get too musicology here, but she uses the standard uh, 1645 progression of uh, Heart and Soul and uh, Blue Moon and so many other standards of that day to sort of disguise this song, disguise the, the um, subversiveness of it within the mold of a pleasant sounding, standard sounding song. And it isn't really until you actually think about what she's doing that it becomes as radical as it does. Yeah, she kind of sounds like a proper lady singing a perfectly respectable song. Yes. 
but she's being very sly, and she can only be talking about one thing. Yes, um, and then the, the but the as I as I read in the book, the, the the X factor of this song is that if you were to listen to it and not understand the English language, the tone of her voice makes it so that you would never, ever guess the subject matter because the tone of her voice is a heartbroken tone to me. Uh, it's somebody who, who feels, who is yearning um, and has melancholy. And so combining that tone of voice with that subject matter and that appropriation of the standard melodies of the day, that combination is what makes her so genius because it, it doesn't make any sense and it's brilliant. But she also sounds a little wry and a little sly and like she's having a good time singing us this song in this way. To me, she sounds like she's having more fun in this song than in Talking Like You. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> And then there's Johnny's Brother, which is also kind of a hilarious song. And the basic concept of that song is she's singing about her life and her love and her husband and her baby, but the, the refrain, or just the last line of each verse is about, and while all this was happening, Johnny's brother was here, and then he was here. And then he gets closer and closer to where they are over the course of the song. And then he's there at the end of the song. We don't know what their relationship is, but he's bouncing the baby on his knee. And there could be no other reason that she's saying all these things other than they had an affair, she wants to have an affair, maybe it's his baby, we don't know. I was thinking today it would be funny if nothing happened with that brother. She just happened to be <laughs> saying where he was. Yeah. Uh, what, what's so great about that song is um, that she, yes, she's talking, in so many of her songs, we have to be part of the equation as listeners because she doesn't spell it out. So we have to, she, she leaves us guessing and she leaves clues and we sort of have to put it together. And it's sort of like her life. Um, she left all these clues, these puzzle pieces and they don't all fit together but they're awfully compelling what's there. I was just gonna say that. Okay. <laughs> So that's a good segue to her biography, which is, she has a very interesting life story. Uh, you know, it has compelling parts to us as people who live in New York and chose to, to do so. But also um, it has its mysterious, confusing parts. Uh, what were you looking for when you set out to find the story of her life? Um, part of Part of what is so appealing is some of the mystery, and I'm, I'm curious about what you hope to find out, what you felt, like, and you were just compelled to find out about her. Yeah, it's a bit hard to explain because to me it sort of goes beyond logic. Um, the, the way that Connie Converse's ghost or her spirit sort of became part of my consciousness. Um, you don't actually believe in ghosts, though, right? I, yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, we'll pick that up in a minute. <laughs> I think that um, the thing that drove me the most to dedicate all this time and all these years to Connie Converse was the feeling that uh, there was a, an injustice to the fact that the world ignored her and that that had to be made right again. And I don't know what made me feel like I was the one to do it, but it didn't seem like anyone else was. <laughs> um, and also, um, as somebody who is a musician myself, and uh, who, who knows, I mean, I've, I've spent many years um, playing music, recording music uh, that exists outside of the mainstream. Um, Connie Converse seemed to me like the best version of what I could ever hope to do as a musician. Like she was way head and shoulders above anything that I could ever hope to do. And look what happened to her. Like that's what I, my feeling was. Look what happened to her. Like that's, if she's, like I gotta put my music aside and be in service to her. 
because um, it seems important to do. So you reached out to her brother. Yes. And you began to sort of follow the threads of her story. Um, what was it like when you first made contact with him? It was good that he was receptive and he was helpful. He was immediately receptive. He, he responded to my email within an hour. How can I be of help? Um, and he and was how old at that point? Let's see, Phil in 2010, uh, probably late 70s, maybe 80. There's also kind of an incredible sense in this book of feeling like you caught a lot of people and stories at the last Just moment time. you could have done so. And there are so many great older people, many of whom have since died in this book, who tell incredible stories about things they remembered from many decades earlier that are just beautiful. So you reach out to the brother, you then, then what happens? Yes, I reached out to uh, her brother and um, I was, I tried to be very uh, delicate in my outreach because I was sensitive to the fact that this is the brother of a woman who disappeared, literally disappeared. And I didn't know what the bounds of good taste were. I didn't want to upset him. Um, and I think I said that in my very first email, you know, if it's not too upsetting to you and if I'm not overstepping my bounds to talk about your sister, I would like to try to help gain more exposure for her music. And he said, oh no, this, the, the worst parts of this happened over 40 years, almost 40 years ago. We're well past, you know, the, the trauma of it. And uh, I'm happy to help you in any way that um, I can be of service. And then as you, what was the first, so what did you, did you learn about her childhood first? Was that? Um, I, I started asking Bill as many questions as he would answer. And it, that turned out to be a lot. Uh, we, <laughs> we, we corresponded pretty frequently and he immediately responded to every question I had for him. And after a time or a, a number of emails went by, he finally said, Howard, why don't you just come out here? Because I have all Connie's stuff, it's in my garage. And you can just take all the time you want and find out everything you want to know. And I said, okay, I'm gonna do that. And I booked a flight to Ann Arbor, Michigan, and I went to Phil Converse's house, and in his garage was this filing cabinet, which was the carefully curated contents of a life. And it had been left behind by her with a very detailed table of contents. It contained hundreds of letters, photographs, diary entries, tape reels, um, artwork, slides. Uh, it was unbelievable to find this thing. And what I also found when I looked at that table of contents was there were a lot of things missing that in the table of contents had been crossed out and next to the crossed out word, it would say, don't. And I didn't know what that meant, but that included a lot of diary entries, of letters, projects, and um, important things that I, I fear may be, may be lost forever. I don't like that. No. <laughs> and I'm curious about what all that stuff was. Um, so, okay, so she grew up in New Hampshire. She had this straight-laced family, anti-saloon and so on. She was a great student in high school. She went to Mount Holyoke for two years? Two years. And she left, and then there was a mysterious disappearance for a while. Yes. And then she resurfaces in New York City. And that eventually becomes a very vibrant, lively, fun scene. And I'm really glad that she had that experience. Um, she also had some pretty sophisticated recording equipment for someone at that time. She did, yeah. <laughs> uh, the machine that she recorded on the Crestwood 404 um, real to real machine was, was cutting edge technology. It must have been very expensive for somebody who was living uh, um, hand to mouth. That was a real investment for her to, to uh, get that machine, which had only been out for I think a year at that point. And that was like 1950? 1950, yeah. She moved there in 1950? Yeah. So she eventually kind of connects to other creative people, starts writing music. She started playing guitar at Mount Holyoke, was that the case? No, I think she said she was, when she was at Mount Holyoke, she was still trying to be a poet and a writer. 
Um, and when she first came to New York, it was to be a novelist, and, and, and she wrote uh, uh, essays for the Far Eastern Survey about international affairs. Um, she was really trying to make her way as a writer. Um, for whatever reason, that process started in 1945. Uh, in 1950, when she moved, right around the time she moved to Grove Street in the village, she suddenly started writing songs for the first time, and I think she probably got her first guitar around then too. Uh, taught herself guitar and began writing these magical earworms that we have today that sound like unlike anybody else. And it really is incredible that we even have her music at all because some she recorded herself, some was just at this house party. And yes. these things on Hudson. Yes, uh, the album that can be uh, listened to now, How Sad, How Lovely, is made up mostly of either uh, well, it's made up completely of either her own recordings or recordings that were made by a guy named Gene Deitch in 1954 in his house uh, in Hastings on Hudson. And Gene Deitch was a amateur recording engineer, music enthusiast. He would hold these music bar parties and invite musicians to come up and perform, uh, mostly traditional musicians. He wasn't used to bringing up people who performed their own music, and he was hesitant about doing that with Connie Converse. But uh, his best friend told him that she was gonna be the next big thing and he trusted his friend's taste. And so Connie Converse showed up one day with his guitar. Uh, she was prompted to sit down in front of the microphone so that this guy, Gene Dutch, could record her. And she uh, proceeded to stun everybody in the room with these songs. Um, and that's actually the, be the beginning of my research after Phil was with Gene Deitch, uh, who I was able to spend time with and talk to before he passed. And you went to Prague. I went to Prague to find that guy, yeah. Yeah, because he wouldn't talk to me otherwise. <laughs> and as a journalist, I just like, first of all, it blows my mind that you wrote this book, which this wasn't even all the work you did by a long shot. I mean, you really, you did so many interviews, and you were so dogged, and you tracked down every last thing you could possibly. And then in this particular interview with Gene Deitch, seemed like a bit of a toughie. Like, I was, just, yeah. just yeah. watching you, and I like that you kind of bring the reader with you on your adventures as you're learning this story, which is a natural and, I think, accessible way to do it. But, you know, sometimes when you're interviewing somebody, you, you want, you want them to be comfortable, of course. You want to have a rapport. You want to respect them. And, you know, you, he talked a lot about things he wanted to talk about about his life, which didn't have anything to do with Connie for a while. And then you tried to get him to talk about Connie, and he wasn't quite as, you know, it wasn't like, he was no Phil Converse. He wasn't no. full of... No. Um, he was a tough guy. Guys, I, you know, I, don't, I hope there are no bad guys or villains in this book. Um, but of, of all the people I write about, I feel that Gene Deitch might not come across so well in this book. Um, and it's just because, um, why is it? It's, it's because uh, he felt that he was Connie Converse's champion. And in many ways, he was not wrong about that. Because had it not been for him bringing one of his Connie Converse recordings onto David Garland's WNYC show in 2004, we would not be here today, and nobody would know who Connie Converse is. So for that alone, Gene Deitch deserves our, uh, our respect and our thanks. Uh, however, um, <clears throat> for whatever reason, he was not the right kind of champion for her. He had attitudes and opinions about her and her music that I think, that I talk about in the book that I think may have held her back even in a way that a different sort of a champion wouldn't have, if that makes sense. He said she didn't, wasn't a good voice. He would say to me, oh, if only we had found somebody good to sing those songs. <laughs> Just crazy. Oh, Connie didn't have a good voice, you know, like. What are you talking about? <laughs> Your voice is incredible. Yeah. And often I feel like it loses something when we're hearing. I, mean, I agree, I agree. So he, was, he was sort of, at, at the same time that he was championing her, he was a bit condescending, I feel like, toward mm -hmm. her and sort of represented the male dominated industry vibe of that day, I think. Uh, 
that, that held her back. She wasn't necessarily an easy fit for the world. No, uh, the, the world at that point wanted women to be uh, vixens or virgins, and she was neither. Uh, and she dressed in a, in a very strange way, or not strange way, I shouldn't say that. She dressed in a way that uh, the world didn't want women, female musicians, to be dressing and comported herself in an unusual way and um, did, yeah, did not go out of her way to, to gussy herself up. Or to charm people necessarily. Or to charm people but at all. One of the things I love about this record, though, is that you can hear her being funny. I mean, you can hear her talking a little bit and addressing the room. Yeah. And she's just charming in that way of, you know, intelligent weirdos all over the place, you know? <laughs> yes. <laughs> like that song, I don't even think you mentioned this song in the book, but that funny song that she seems to play, I assume at that party, where it's uh, the song about um, blowing someone a ballad and, the lobster salad. and then blows her a lobster salad. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's just a, a fragment that's on the House Hat Elevator. Yeah, you're you're right, I don't mention that in the book. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's, I'm glad it's on the album because it's this nice little, it's, it's so strange and funny and it's just a kind of hint of her personality and her humor. And, I, I agree. I, I think it's important not to miss how funny she was yeah. because uh, people think of her, Connie Conger sometimes as, as the original sad girl, you know, the melancholy wallflower. And she is that to an extent, but she's also hilarious. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I guess that's why I think of Flannery O'Connor a little bit too, because Flannery O'Connor was not going out of her way to look conventionally like a, you know, 50s bombshell. Right. <laughs> she was being herself and sort of letting the world come to her. Yes, and, and I think maybe the difference is the, the, the modes that they were in, the, the fields that they were in. I think a, a writer was sort of allowed to do that, whereas a, a performer was not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. So she's in New York for 10 years or so? 15. 15. And she goes through a few different artistic phases and makes some good connections. And, on that Walter Cronkite program, inexplicably. Yes. Were there things that you wish that you could have found in the, you know, I feel like that must be one of them. That's one of the sort of, yeah. I feel like you found just about everything that you could have wanted to find, but that might be one elusive. Well, there's no footage of Connie Converse performing anywhere, and that would seem to be the most likely footage that would exist is her 1954 appearance on the CBS Morning Show with Walter Cronkite. Uh, but we only have still images that somebody took of the television set as the show was airing, uh, which is completely bizarre. Uh, Phil Converse didn't know who took the pictures, but the pictures are there in her photo album, and you see the frame of the TV uh, in, in each picture. Um, and uh, uh, I also didn't know this at the time, but I, I learned in my research that the CBS Morning Show was, was shot in, at Grand Central Station uh, in, in those days, in, the, in, in a floor above the main concourse. And uh, they had a big screen in the concourse that showed it as it was airing. So everybody that was bustling through Grand Central that day saw Connie Conference in her one appearance on, on TV. Wait, do we know what she played even? No, we don't know what she played. And uh, CBS Archives has no record of her being on the show, no logs. Uh, no contracts, no releases, no evidence at all that she was on it. Did she write about it in her diary? If she did, it was dumped. <laughs> it's just, there's so many weird details about this whole story. Um, like the time that you are driving to a Shags concert in New Hampshire. <laughs> Which is just like a nice little interlude. And you just randomly get out of your car and you're suddenly in a Converse cemetery. Yes. And then you continue on your journey. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of like the lobster salad song. It's just <laughs> a nice little bit of whimsy and weirdness, and then, and then we move on. So she, she spent a long time being an artist of a kind, working at an offset printing shop? Yes. For like 10 years or so, and a yes. long time. Also strange. Yes. Not a common job for women no. at that time. Um, in, in this neighborhood. neighborhood like three blocks from here. <laughs> and ended up, you know, she lived in a bunch of different places. She lived with her weirder brother for a while. I, not to be mean, but she lived with her sort of more difficult brother. 
Right. She had an older brother named Paul who was uh, deceased by the time I started this project. He died in the 90s. And um, Paul and his wife Isla and their young baby moved to Harlem in 1955 and invited Connie Converse to join them there as their roommate, which she did. Uh, and they lived together for a few years. It was only supposed to be a year. And it was, a, I think, an incredibly stressful time for Connie Converse because the older brother was uh, having an affair, an extramarital affair, while trying to re uh, retain some semblance of a happy married life. Um, and I don't want to talk about Paul too much. <laughs> no, we don't need to get it's into It's in the book. Yeah. yeah, I don't want to talk about Paul. He's a confusing yeah. character. Well, another thing that's interesting about her story is that, you know, she's um, she's really forging her own path. She's not living like her family. Were her brothers both academics? Was Paul an academic? Yeah, to an extent. Yeah. But in any case, they, they lived fairly conventional lives, her relatives, certainly her parents. And her parents were pretty square, I think it's safe to say. Yeah. But she was really doing her own thing. But at the same time, she lived with both of her brothers for a time. She took her mother on this awful sounding multi-week trip to Alaska at one point <laughs> that she did not want to do, but just dutifully did anyway. Yes. You know, like so many artists, she's very tied to her family, very different from them, loves them, is close to them, finds them exasperating in some ways. Um, but they really are a big theme throughout her life. And she ended up, when she finally left New York, she moved to Ann Arbor and then ended up living with her other brother for a while and had some good years in Ann Arbor. It sounded like the she did. Journal of Conflict Resolution, yeah. which seemed to kind of fall apart in part because of some conflicts they were unable to resolve. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true, yes. Um, but then she, she lived with her brother, and then things got kind of rough for her and were kind of sad at the end. Things got really rough for Connie Converse. She, she only moved in with her brother Phil when things got desperate. Um, she, uh, she had a, a series of nervous breakdowns uh, in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, and, and I am of the belief that she, around 1971, I think she was ready to disappear at that point. Um, she wrote, as she drafted a letter to her boss, uh, at the Journal of Conflict Resolution, um, saying that she needed to take a leave of absence. And in the letter, there's a lot of the language that she would use three years later in 1974 when she actually did disappear. And I think that her plan got short-circuited because out of the blue, one of her colleagues showed up to her door one day right around this crisis time and presented her with a very large check and said, We've taken up a collection, uh, your friends and colleagues who love you so much and understand how important you are. And this is for you to just take six months and do whatever you want with, and don't even worry about repaying it. And at first she wrote, she wrote to him, at first I didn't want to accept it because I didn't want charity, but I then understood that this is an investment in my future, and so I will, I will accept it humbly. And she took the money and she went to England where she, she had never left the country before. She went to England for six months. She came back. Uh, when she returned, her job and the Center for Research on Conflict Resolution had evaporated. Um, they, the University of Michigan had shut it down. And so she had no source of income. She moved in with Phil. She, according to Phil's kids, became alcoholic and um, kind of a mess. And something happened that made her leave Phil's house and get a different apartment in what is now considered a, a historic African American neighborhood, a historic black neighborhood. Um, and she lived there for about a year and a half. What made her leave Phil's house? I don't know, but I think there was a, maybe a disagreement between her and him and his wife. She moved uh, to this other part of town. Um, she tried to do uh, a number of different things in town 
uh, including being part of um, an alternative educational uh, exchange program, uh, and also trying to be part of a neighborhood revitalization, downtown neighborhood revitalization effort. Um, Which also felt quite modern and cool. Yeah, yes, very much so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. She was kind of exchanging, she would teach people to do stuff and they would teach her to Yes, do there stuff. were these things then that she became a part of called learning exchanges. And she became the head of the Ann Arbor Learning Exchange. And what a learning exchange was, was uh, you call up the number of the learning exchange and you say, hey, I'm interested in uh, guitar playing or I'm interested in learning French or I'm interested in basket weaving. And the person on the phone says, oh, we have somebody that can teach you that. And they would connect you to somebody that could teach you that one-on-one. -on -one. And then if you had a skill that you could teach, you would volunteer that and be connected with somebody that you could teach. And these exchanges would often be um, done without money, uh, just for the pleasure of learning and sharing the knowledge that we have with one another in an intimate way. And this is what Connie Converse was doing um, shortly before she disappeared. And then when she actually disappeared, things had gotten kind of, things needed a change. I didn't realize until I read this book that she actually wrote letters to people. And it really was like a formal kind of clean going away. Um, and we do not know what happened. But I was grateful actually that she had written those notes, which were so, I mean, melancholy, sure, but, but also thoughtful and smart and, you know, you really feel for her, but um, it seemed, it all seemed very intentional, obviously. It was very intentional, yeah. Um, she was going to eject herself from society, and uh, she wrote letters to family and friends saying as much, and uh, many of the letters said that she was coming back here to New York, but uh, she was never seen again, body was never found, car was never found. If she is still alive, she is 98 somewhere. Uh, and not in touch with her brothers who died a long time ago. That's, that's very mysterious. <laughs> so, so in telling her story, you, um, you were both you were trying to, you had to convince a lot of people that her story is important. There are many people who did not even know who she was. Um, so you simultaneously have been her cheerleader and her, you know, advocate and also her biographer. That sounds kind of tough. Well, it, it started with, um, I started performing her songs in concert and narrating her story. That turned into a play, which was produced here in New York. Uh, I wrote, uh, at, at the time that I was working on the play, I was deep into the process of writing this book already. And I started uh, calling around to publishers or, or doing outreach to publishers. And publisher says, you, the publisher said, you gotta be kidding me you want to write a biography about somebody nobody's ever heard of? <laughs> and you've never written a book before? <laughs> I love that this exists so much. <laughs> so I, so one of the editors at, a, at one of the publishers I talked to uh, said, my suggestion is write an essay about her and try to get some interest that way. And you can maybe leverage that to try to get a book deal, but don't get your hopes up. You know, you might get a, uh, an academic, uh, a university press or something like that, um, which I would have been fine. So at that point, I contacted my friend, Sarah Larson. And I said, Sarah, I've just had this conversation with an editor at a publishing house who says that I should write an, an essay about Connie Converse to try to sell my book. Um, who do you think I should send it to? Because I, I didn't know anybody in the publishing world. Sarah was only, one of the only people that I knew. And Sarah, I knew, you know, Sarah's a fan of my music and um, had come to see my play. 
so Sarah said, well, send me the essay and I'll, maybe I'll have some ideas. And I sent it to her thinking, you know, she would refer me to some blog or, um, you know, <laughs> um, some, some small thing. And, and instead she said, Howard, I actually think I want to send this to my editor here at the New Yorker. No promises, but uh, I, you know, I think this, I think he might like it and he did. And uh, so then I had an essay published by the New Yorker. I took that to publishers. Publishers still said, no. Um, it's an interesting story, but nobody knows who she is. Uh, and I'm, a lot, a lot, a lot of publishers turned this book down. And the publishers that did show interest said, maybe, but it's not gonna be a doorstop of a book. <laughs> it's going to be a little short book. You better think about 150 pages, 200 pages. And thank God, somehow, John Parsley of Dutton Books got it. He got it. And he said, yes, I want you to write this book, and I want you to write it exactly how you want to write it. And he let me write a doorstop. <laughs> when you first showed me your essay, which was long, that... Uh, it was. I'm yeah. sorry about that. And I, no, that's fine. And I'm a writer, too, and I don't always love it when people advise me to take out large chunks of what I have written, or, you know, but you were really good about taking edits, and I was really impressed by that, and I remain so, because few people are. <laughs> but you, you know, you were good at... Um, being open-minded about what would and wouldn't interest people, even though you knew you had an important story to tell and that the long version was the version that would be the best version. But at the same time, there are plenty of parts that might not, it's already a hard sell in certain ways, unless you love her music, as many of us do. But, um, you know, and you're a first time writer of something of this scope, so it, it's hard to know what to leave in, what to put in and what to leave out sometimes. I trusted you, and you were right. <laughs> and there must have been things that you couldn't include in the in the book, because you did just an unbelievable amount of research. Were there things that you wish had gone in that didn't, or things that were great details that you understood had to be cut, but you were sent Similar to the conversations that we had about my essay, I trusted John Parsley at Dutton. And um, if he said, I don't think this belongs here, I took it out. If he said, develop this more, I did it. And um, we had an amazing relationship that way. We never had a single crossword. It's fascinating to me because it feels like um, it's just a really compelling story. And I think we're mostly reading it because we're already fans and we're really curious about her story. But, you know, when you care about an artist, there's a certain amount that you can learn from learning about their life. And there's a certain amount you can't. There's this ineffable magic that, you know, you're never going to. But it can be instructive and moving to read about who the actual person was. So, yeah. Uh, thank you. I think that I see that we, uh, okay, um, we're going to go to questions in a second. But uh, I, my sense is that people that already know about Connie Converse may not, this is, I didn't write this book for them. I mean, I hope there will be things in, in this book that will delight them and interest them. But I really wrote it for people that don't know who she is. Um, because if I was only writing it for Connie Converse fans, there would be 12 people that would be reading this book. So I wasn't writing it for, for the connoisseur. Symbiosis. 